Our final presentation this morning is from Dr. Michael Schmidling. Dr. Schmidling is a New Jersey local, having received formalized training through an accelerated BS, MD, joint degree program at Rutgers University and UMDNJ Medical School. During his time in medical school, he received many honors, including acceptance into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Society, and he graduated in the top 5% of his class. He has published in numerous peer-reviewed journals and presented posters at national meetings. After completing his training, he worked with the University Radiology Group and served as assistant professor at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. It's a tertiary care center in New Brunswick. While at University Radiology Group, he first became interested in the treatment of varicose veins and minimally invasive treatments of cancer, which is now termed interventional oncology. He opened a vein center and began treating patients with all types of venous disease. And in 2013, he was honored as top doc in the New Jersey Monthly Magazine. Dr. Schmidling will talk to us now about the role of interventional radiology. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Schmidling. All right, thank you very much. As uh, noted, my name is Mike Schmeling. I'm a local. Uh, I practice at Atlantic Medical Imaging. One of my disclosures is I am a partner with this uh, local radiology group. Uh, my wife is also an employee and shareholder at Actelium Pharmaceuticals, but I won't be discussing any medications that they produce. Uh, thank you, first off, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. <clears throat> and thank you also for the genus honorarium and the uh, spirit of the lecture, we will be sponsoring a PAD screening event uh, through. Uh, Atlantic Medical Imaging has a foundation, so forgive me for the next 30 seconds as I plug that. Uh, this, this is a charitable foundation uh, where we either provide free imaging or um, uh, low-cost imaging to uh, local patients. Uh, we have free mammography screening. We sponsor a mammography van. Uh, we also do low-dose CT lung screening and uh, provide coronary CTA uh, for, for free. Uh, just a brief outline, and I'll uh, ask for your forgiveness ahead of time. I'm going to set my timer so I don't go over. Um, I do have a lot of slides, um, so I will move pretty quickly. Um, just an outline of what I'll, I want to touch, touch on. I will talk about peripheral arterial disease as an overview, uh, go a little bit uh, more in-depth in uh, critical limb ischemia. Also talk about some diagnostic testing. Uh, very briefly, uh, from a vascular specialist standpoint, touch on non-healing wounds and how we see them. Uh, then we'll get into some of the endovascular treatments and finish off with some case examples. Uh, so this is the uh, culprit lesion. This is an atherosclerotic lesion. Uh, obviously, atherosclerosis in the lower extremities is referred to as peripheral arterial disease. But as you can see here, this uh, yellow material there in the center of the vessel is the lipid material accumulating in the uh, subintimal space in the wall of the vessel, which leads to narrowing of the vessel. Atherosclerosis, as we've come to see, uh, is a systemic process, uh, but it involves uh, many different uh, cellular messengers and inflammation and impacts uh, vessels throughout the body, including cere cerebrovascular vessels, cardiovascular, as well as the lower extremities. So it is uh, and should be seen as a systemic process. Uh, PAD uh, is very common, occurring in up to one to three people uh, over their lifetime. Uh, clearly, there are race differences uh, much more common in African Americans compared to uh, Caucasians. Uh, this, I believe, is the male slide, so you can see the uh, larger orange bar all the way to the right is African Americans compared to the uh, bar on the left, the blue bar. Uh, so it's probably more than double the uh, prevalence in African Americans compared to whites. Uh, and as you can see, as the chart goes towards the right, uh, it becomes much more prevalent as we age. Uh, this is the same chart, but for females. So uh, Dr. Richwine touched on some of this, and there's some overlap between our two lectures. Um, the estimates from the CDC place about 8 million people in the U.S. having peripheral arterial disease, although I have seen numbers up to 12 million, so there's obviously a range. Uh, 12 to 20 percent of individuals over 60 have PAD, and as Dr. Richwine mentioned, it clearly is an underdiagnosed condition. Uh, there was an interesting study called the Partner Study, which looked at uh, uh, which showed an overall PAD diagnosis rate of 29% in its patient population that it looked at. Um, and the interesting part about this study was that it, uh, it 
showed that 83% of patients were aware of their diagnosis, meaning aware of their disease state, but only 49% of their primary care physicians were aware of that. So that's clearly a discrepancy and hopefully something we can all work on. Uh, risk factors for PAD, I'm sure we're all familiar with these. Race I just alluded to. Uh, male versus female is a little bit unclear. Some studies show it more common in males compared to females. Others more common in females compared to males. Uh, age, clearly uh, the prevalence increases as we age. Uh, and then the biggies, diabetes, hypertension, and renal insufficiency all play into this. Uh, with regards to modifiable risk factors, clearly smoking is the biggest risk factor, and we can't em emphasize that enough, that smoking is a huge modifiable risk factor, and many, many of my patients uh, come with a smoking history, and we're constantly uh, you know, asking them to uh, make an effort to stop smoking. Dyslipidemia could be one of both. Obviously, there's heritable factors with that, but then there are also modifiable risk factors as well. Uh, generally, we can break down PAD into asymptomatic disease and symptomatic disease being further broken down into claudication or patients with critical ischemia. This is a very busy um, diagram from the task to document, um, but there's some uh, very interesting and useful information in this. First off, the rate of asymptomatic PAD in this patient population was between uh, 20 and 50 percent. So 20 and 50 percent of patients with peripheral arterial disease did not have any symptoms and therefore did not know about their uh, uh, condition. Clearly this um, raises the question, should we be screening for this? And clearly the answer to that is yes. Uh, there's a consensus that patients with asymptomatic PAD uh, are at a higher risk for cardiovascular events and cerebrovascular events. Uh, epidemiologic studies show a fourfold increase in cardiovascular disease and death in this patient population. And there's a significant percentage of patients with PAD which will also have progressive disease, so they go from an asymptomatic state to a symptomatic state. So who should be screened, obviously, should be the next question. And there's fairly well-defined patient populations which should be screened based upon risk factors. Clearly, any patient older than 65 should be screened. Uh, patients older than 50 with at least one of the, uh, with, um, sorry, with at least a risk factor should be screened, and patients less than 50 with diabetes plus one risk factor, any other risk factor should be screened for PAD. Uh, there's different ways, obviously, of screening. We do it all the time with our history and physical exam. Uh, Dr. Richwine stressed the importance of ABI. Uh, it is very important, but can also be misleading, which I'll get to. And then uh, PVR examination, which is a pulse volume recording exam, which in the process of doing that exam measures uh, the ABI, uh, kind of borders between a screening exam and can also be considered a diagnostic exam in some settings. So back to our chart here, if you look at the symptomatic uh, patients, either those patients with um, typical or atypical claudication, that's up to about 75% of the overall population uh, patients with PAD. If you look at the five-year outcomes, there's a significant mortality in this patient population with PAD, symptomatic PAD, uh, 10 to 15% five-year mortality, um, and 20% rate of uh, heart attack or stroke. And I mentioned the progressive disease, up to 30% of patients with asymptomatic PAD or symptomatic PAD will have progressive disease. Uh, and this is the scary part of this slide, the critical limb ischemia, which clearly is the smaller percentage of patients with peripheral arterial disease. It accounts for 1 to 3 percent. But if you look at the one-year outcomes, the mortality rate uh, in this study population was 25 percent, 30 percent rate of amputation. And in one year, 45 percent of this patient population with critical limb ischemia will be alive with both limbs, with both legs. Putting this into perspective, Dr. Richwine had a very similar slide. We should have slot, uh, shared slides. <laughs> um, if you put this into perspective with some other bad players, um, critical limb ischemia has a five-year survival rate of 50 percent. So it puts it on par with uh, renal, stage 3 renal cell carcinoma, stage 3C colorectal carcinoma, and stage 2 pancreatic CA. So it's a significant diagnosis. The Rutherford classification is a classification, commonly used classification scheme to classify uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, the first is uh, category zero, which is going to designate those patients with asymptomatic uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, 
categories one through three are symptomatic uh, claudications. So these are the claudicants, uh, further subdivided from mild to severe claudication one through three. So just to take a step back, what is claudication? Uh, claudication actually is uh, limping in Latin, and it's basically defined as uh, pain, discomfort, or tiredness in the legs uh, while walking or ambulating. Uh, there's different etiologies. Not all claudication is arterial in, in nature. There's also venous claudication and neurogenic claudication. Um, so with arterial, we're also referred to as intermittent vascular claudication that basically occurs uh, when patients or people walk, uh, the exercise uh, uh, increases the meta metabolic demand of the tissues of the leg greater than that can, that can which be supplied by the vasculature, so it results in claudication. Uh, with venous, cl venous claudication, typically we see venous stasis, reflux, uh, and obstruction of the veins, and then neurogenic claudication, typically seen with spinal stenosis. The last uh, four categories um, designate critical limb ischemia. Uh, and that goes from category four, where there's ischemic rest pain and then varying degrees of tissue loss for categories five and six. Uh, so if I were to define critical limb ischemia, it basically, critical limb ischemia is present when the arterial supply is inadequate, inadequate to meet the baseline metabolic demand of the tissues of the leg. This is a, quite an interesting study. This was. Uh, a study out of Duke that looked at Medicare data from 2000 to 2008, and it basically looked at the mortality rate of critical limb ischemia with and without amputation. So if you look at um, critical limb ischemia, one-year mortality rate without an amputation, they had a mortality rate of 24.2 percent, so very similar to the other diagram. If they uh, looked at the population with critical limb ischemia with uh, an amputation, the mortality rate doubled to 48 percent. And the really interesting part of this study is that this was independent of cardiovascular risk factors or um, cerebrovascular risk factors. In other words, if they looked at those two populations of with and without um, amputation, all comers, it's more common, uh, all, cause, all cause mortality is more common with a critical limb ischemia with an amputation. Um, but the rate of stroke and heart attack is less in patients with amputation compared to those without amputation. So it's clearly not related to uh, death from uh, uh, stroke or heart attack. And if you take this, uh, so critical limb ischemia with an amputation, the one-year mortality rate is much worse than stage 3 renal cell carcinoma, stage 3C colorectal carcinoma, and pancreatic cancer, stage 2. So it's a significant uh, disease burden. So why is this? Why is this so much more uh, higher mortality rate with uh, amputation? It's not really clear from their study, from their data, but what is clear is that it's not related to cardiovascular or cerebrovascular risk factors. My personal theory is, which I haven't seen anything in the literature to support this, is uh, these patients at that point when they're going into the hospital for an amputation, a surgical procedure, these are very fragile patients with multiple comorbidities, and many times they just honestly don't make it out of the hospital after the amputation. For instance, I just had a patient two months ago uh, that I did an iliac stent, and then the patient went to the hospital for a common femoral endarterectomy, relatively minor surgical, surgical uh, vascular surgical procedure, and never made it out of the hospital. So amputation is very common. Uh, um, 4,320 legs every day are amputated, legs and feet. Uh, Dr. Richwine mentioned the ankle brachial index, and this basically uh, is a slide summarizing that. It's an, I have it under diagnostic imaging, but it's really not an imaging study, but a screening exam. And as she mentioned, it's taking the brachial artery pressure uh, and both the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial artery pressures in each leg. So you take the higher of the two brachial pressures, and then in each leg, the higher of uh, dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial artery pulse. and that. DP or PT pulse over the brachial pressure is the uh, ABI. Um, as she mentioned, uh, there's different cutoffs, and the, the sensitivity is about 70 to 90 percent based upon what cutoff level you use. Uh, generally, 0 0.9 is considered, above 0 0.9 is considered normal, uh, and above uh, 1.3, 1 1.2, uh, above that is abnormal, meaning vessel hardening. Um, and then it's uh, graded from, uh, you know, mild, moderate, and severe.
I will say the ABI can be misleading. Um, this was one of my patients and his ABI was one. I rechecked it myself. His ABI is one, but clearly he has vascular disease. He has a necrotic great toe. Uh, note he's also missing. He only has four toes, so he's had previous amputations. Uh, PVR or pulse volume recordings um, is a non-imaging modality and it kind of borders between a screening and diagnostic exam, so certainly can be used and is commonly used in a screening capacity. Um, there are several components to the exam. Segmental pressures as well as the ABI are measured, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, we also look at the pulse volume uh, recording, which basically entails taking a blood pressure cuff, inflating it to uh, subsystolic pressure, and charting the volume change based upon that. And some exams also obtain Doppler tracings. So this is a PVR waveform, and you can see up in the upper left-hand corner of that is the normal waveform, where it says sharp systolic upstroke, and there's this little uh, wave deflection on the downward uh, wave. And you can see uh, mild, moderate, and severe changes in that waveform. This is a Doppler waveform tracing, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Normal is the triphasic waveform all the way to the left, and as you lose phases and flattening of that, it uh, shows progressive uh, disease. Segmental pressures basically will measure pressures at different um, levels down the thigh. So depending on the systems, either one thigh or a high and low thigh, then calf, and then the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial, and uh, toe pressures in some as well. And what we're looking for that is a pressure difference either between stations in the same leg. So we're looking for a pressure drop of 20 to 30. And again, uh, there's different cutoffs uh, between 20 and 30 between the high thigh and, and calf or high thigh and mid thigh. Um, or a horizontal pressure difference, so a difference of greater than 20 to 30 between the right and left same station. So this is just a case of that. This is a 49-year-old female, five-year history of right buttock and thigh claudication. On physical exam, she had diminished pulses on the right ankle. Um, her ABI, however, was normal. It was 0.98 on the right and 1.23 on the left. This is an example of these segmental pressures, and as I said, you can see uh, the different thigh stations, calf stations, and ankle, as well as a digit. So you can see that there's, uh, well, we'll go through it. Uh, this is the pulse volume recording, um, and you can see the, the black bands or the pressure cuffs, so the levels where they measure the pressure. Uh, so you can see the waveform on the right has that normal, um, on the right of the image, not the right of the patient, uh, right of the image has that normal waveform pattern with a sharp systolic upstroke and that little deflection of the wave going down, whereas opposed on the left, it's blunted and kind of flattened. Uh, same thing, this is a Doppler waveform tracing, you see normal triphasic waveform on the right and blunted waveform on the left. So this is a summary of this case. So there's a right thigh has a, a pressure of 134, and I didn't touch on this, but the, the thigh ratio, to, we do the same ratio to the ankle, I'm sorry, to the brachial artery. Uh, the ratio is 1.02. On the left, the thigh pressure is 165 with a ratio of 1.25. So all of this, uh, these stations, the pressure and the waveform really is reflective of the segment before the segment that you're actually interrogating or, or measuring. Um, so the diagnosis for this patient, I won't torture you, is a right iliac stenosis or occlusion, or alternatively, I didn't put it in the choices, uh, would be a common femoral artery stenosis or um, occlusion. So looking at the segmental pressures here, the thigh ratio, really a thigh ratio should be 1.2 or higher. I didn't tell you that. Uh, so the thigh ratio on the right is uh, 1.02, so that's abnormal. And there's also a significant uh, pressure difference from the right to left. So it went from 165 on the left to 134 on the right. As I just mentioned, these waveforms are, are abnormal here. Uh, we also do uh, duplex imaging. Uh, it allows us a little more specific uh, determination of location and degree of stenosis. Uh, it's great for screening for AAA. It's great for surveillance of bypass grafts. Sensitivity and specificity are pretty good. Um, on the top, there's a normal triphasic waveform, and on the bottom image there, you can see the waveform is now monophasic. It's only above the baseline. There's nothing that goes below the baseline. And I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but the velocities are quite elevated. Uh, I can't even see it. <laughs> it's over 250. Um, so that was a stenosis. We're, we see that by velocity elevation and the change in the waveform. CTA, on the other hand, uses um, 
CAT scan and an iodinated contrast. Uh, images are obtained in the axial plane with isotropic voxels, which basically means the volume of tissue measured, which is usually 0.6 millimeters, is the same on measured uh, in the X, Y, and Z coordinates. So it allows a 3D data set to be viewed and manipulated on a workstation. So this is one of the source axial images. We can see the arteries highlighted there with white. And this is what we can generate uh, from those uh, axial images. And the diagnosis in this case, again, I won't torture you, is a right iliac stenosis or occlusion. There's some debate. It's either a very high-grade stenosis or an occlusion. And it's actually the same patient that I showed you over here. So you can see an actual anatomic definition, which me as a proceduralist, I need to know the anatomic definition of what I'm, I'm going to be treating. Uh, MRA uses uh, contrast uh, techniques similar to CTA, but it also has some uh, non-contrast sequences, which is very important in patients with renal insufficiency or severe allergies. Uh, and we can also do some additional tricks, no pun intended. Uh, there's a protocol uh, called TRIP. Tricks, which actually has temporal um, resolution as well, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, so this is a MRA runoff, beautiful pictures, and I'll show you the beautiful normals. The ones that are not normal don't look this pretty usually. And this, if it plays, is the Tricks imaging that I talked about. So it's actually like looking at a conventional catheter-based angiogram. So sometimes you can see collateral filling through this that you wouldn't otherwise see on static CTA imaging. And again, I mentioned um, non-contrast imaging. All these pictures were obtained without, uh, without any contrast at all. Uh, conventional angiography is an invasive procedure. Uh, it does involve placing a catheter in the vessel. Uh, it uses contrast, can use iodinated contrast, same type of contrast that we use with CT. Um, or we can use carbon dioxide, which I'll show you some pictures of that. So for patients with severe allergies or renal insufficiency, it's uh, a, a great test to use. And we can treat patients uh, without using contrast. Um, there's other adjunctive testing, uh, including pressure measurements and IVIS or intravascular ultrasound. That little picture on the right there was the first IVIS. We actually just got IVIS probably three months ago. Uh, not, not everyone has it. It's not that common, but it, it helps. It's a great adjunct test. Uh, and obviously, the biggest thing in this uh, conventional angiography allows us to treat the patient. So this is a DSA, or digital subtraction angiogram image on the left. You see it. Uh, uh, the image obtained uh, with the contrast in the artery and you can see the bones and basically we take a mask image first with the bones with no contrast and then in inject the contrast and take subsequent uh, images and we can subtract out the bone digitally subtract uh, this is a picture um, from a dsa with carbon dioxide so you can see on the picture on the left you see it as a lucency but we alter the computer manipulates that so we can see it like regular angiogram so if, you, if we have a patient with stage three chronic kidney disease, non-healing wound left foot, uh, which diagnostic study would be appropriate to evaluate this patient? We can either do A or C. Um, a obviously would only give us uh, diagnostic uh, pictures uh, as opposed to C with a conventional angiogram. We can both do imaging and treatment in the same sitting. And I didn't mention, I'm sure you're all aware of it, the, uh, not only is iodinated contrast an issue in patients with renal insufficiency, but anyone with a creatin, I'm sorry, a GFR of less than 30, uh, we really don't want to be giving gadolinium because of the, the risks of nephrogenic sclerosis. So my vascular specialist, non-wound care specialist, <laughs> take on wounds. Um, certainly from our perspective, it's important to consider um, the type of wound not that I will specifically be treating the wound, I'll leave that to the specialist, uh, but it helps me to get a handle on what's the etiology for the wound. Is this, is this vascular, I'm sorry, arterial or venous, something that I may help in the healing process with. Um, and it's important to point out that uh, between one third and two thirds of wound, uh, diabetic foot ulcers have a vascular component. And it's very common, as Dr. Richwine mentioned, that a lot of times patients have both arterial and venous components to the wound in addition to other, other issues. And one thing, uh, I just went past it, one thing that uh, I as a proceduralist when I'm seeing these patients always have to keep in mind uh, is this wound painful in this patient population, a lot of diabetics with a lot of neuropathy. I've had many patients that uh, there's no pain at all in the wound and it's clearly a vascular arterial wound. Um, pulse check, again, Dr. Richwine said this, um, 
don't let the pulses fool you. I've had patients with normal ABIs and normal pulses, uh, and they have a toe which is falling off because of vascular disease. Um, obviously, we need to be attuned and look for uh, venous hypertension and uh, venous uh, components of wounds. So we were always looking for varicosities, hyperpigmentation, and that lipodermatosclerosis. sclerosis. I had a difficult time pronouncing it too. I hate that word. <laughs> um, so we always have to keep that in mind and search for it. And ambulation, does the patient have claudication? Does the patient have rest pain? Where is it? And again, taking into consideration neuropathy. And the lack of ambulation also often leads to venous hypertension. So there's a lot of uh, causes for wounds that we have to keep in mind and try and tease out what the etiology is. Uh, and clearly, these next couple slides I basically put in here just to show that there's such an overlap of where wounds can occur and you can have, um, you know, concaminant issues going on at the same time. So enough about diagnosis, a little bust on my uh, diagnostic colleagues. Uh, so treatment of PAD, um, my first thing that I put on here is smoking cessation because I do think it's very important, particularly in patients that we're treating. There's nothing more disheartening than spending three hours opening up someone with critical limb ischemia to see them reeking of cigarette smoke next time and see the stent that I laid in their SFA is now down. Um, so clearly smoking cessation is important. Um, we, we clearly need to optimize medical management, um, some very interesting um, facts about the uh, hemoglobin H1C uh, that Dr. Richwine, um, so obviously diabetes control and glycemic control, but also hypertension, statin therapy, and, um, and this is my favorite healthy lifestyle choices, diet and exercise, and probably more for the claudicants than the critical ischemia patients. Um, Antiplatelet therapy certainly has a role. Um, there's been studies that have shown a 25% reduction in cardiovascular events on patients uh, who take aspirin. And the Capri, uh, Capri, uh, geez, talk. Capri trial uh, showed benefit of uh, clopidogrel over uh, aspirin in patients with symptomatic PAD. Uh, question of dual antiplatelet therapy is probably beyond this lecture. I use it. Um, there are some studies out there um, in the cardi uh, cardiac literature after coronary stents where they've shown um, improvement uh, using uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And one thing which is um, becoming more apparent is there's a lot of patients which are clopidogrel non-responders. So if it, the estimates vary anywhere between 5 and 44 percent of patients, you give them clopidogrel and it just doesn't work, it doesn't, doesn't affect their platelets at all. Uh, so I like to have dual agents, if nothing more than just to make sure that they have something which is uh, having some antiplatelet effect. Um, intermittent claudication patients um, don't necessarily have to undergo further workup or intervention. It really depends on the degree of claudication, and that's where the Rutherford classification comes into play. Typically, if it's lifestyle limiting, we'll consider doing a further workup and treatment. If it's not, and they want to try a trial of uh, conservative therapy, which is regimented exercise programs or some medications, we'll, we certainly will do that in Rutherford 1 and 2. Rutherford 3 could go either way. Um, patients with symptomatic uh, claudication and evidence for inflow disease, that's a different story. Generally, the recommendations are that that is treated. And clearly, any patient with critical ischemia with either rest pain or tissue loss related to arterial insufficiency should undergo revascularization as soon as possible. And that's an AHA level 1A recommendation. So our PAD algorithm, pretty much I summed it up, is this. Uh, patients with Rutherford 1 through 3, uh, we consider, um, you know, conservative therapy, rather for three through six, um, generally undergo more workup um, and possible treatment. And treatment generally nowadays is endovascular therapy, although there are certain circumstances where surgical therapy is um, considered. And one key thing from our standpoint is that these patients are followed. I am a radiologist, but I do have a clinic. I do follow patients. We do see every one of these patients at three, uh, sometimes two weeks, uh, definitely at one month, three months, six months, 12 months, and then annual after that. And that's um, critical because many times in the past, these patients have seen someone, they've had an intervention, and then no one follows them. The stent goes down, they end up in the ER with an acutely ischemic leg. Not a situation we want to be in. Um, so just to get into some of the uh, techniques that we can use, angioplasty, you're all familiar with, I'm sure, uh, basically is a small uh, 
catheter-mounted balloon that we put into the stenosis to widen the area that's uh, stenosed or occluded. Uh, cutting balloons is a variant of that where there's little atherotomes, little blades on the balloon which help um, cut either resistant stenoses and, and the thought process is that this is more of a controlled intimal injury so it decreases the rate of dissection. And it certainly helps in resistant stenoses and recoil. Uh, there's some newer devices on the market, drug-coated balloons. Um, Basically, this deposits a chemotherapeutic agent um, at the intimal surface, so it's really more of a delivery device, and actually, usually you prep with another balloon and then use this to deliver the drug at the uh, intimal surface. Atherectomy is something that we use heavily, particularly in this pa uh, patient population with critical limb ischemia, which I'll get into in a little bit more. There's different types of atherectomy. Um, one of the big ones is the or orbital atherectomy, and the device is shown in the middle. That's particularly key in patients with calcified vessels, which many times these patients are, and particularly helpful in below knee vessels, which many of these patients have below knee disease. Uh, there's some protection devices, basically is a little filter wire. Uh, it's a mesh filter on the end of um, a guide wire uh, to catch any debris that, that launches from our intervention. And obviously stents we use, there's different variants of that. Um, nitinol self-expanding stents, which is shown on the top. And these are bare metal stents. Uh, and then there's a balloon mounted stent on the bottom. And again, depending on which vessel we're treating um, and what the stenosis is, we'll determine which type of balloon. So for instance, uh, superficial femoral artery, we always want to use a flexible uh, stent. So we would use a, a self-expanding stent. Compared to an iliac, which that's not as important, uh, we use a balloon mounted stent, which has greater radial force. Uh, and then the variant of a stent is a stent graft, which is basically covered in a graft material, typically a PTFE. Um, and that's meant to uh, limit the neointimal hyperplasia, which can cause stents to narrow. Uh, there's some drug-coated stents out on the market, and we have some tiny little coronary stents that we use in the tibial vessels. Um, but we're hoping, and there, actually there are other um, stents used in the SFA, um, but the problem with these, A, they're very expensive, and B, it's still very dependent upon the base stent. So if you have a stent which is not as flexible or not a great base stent, it's not a great thing to be putting in the SFA. So we're patiently waiting for new stents to come out. Uh, for patients that do have some clot, either venous or arterial, there's thrombolysis and thrombectomy. Um, typically, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, is what we're using for thrombolysis. Um, but we also have some catheters which um, mechanically uh, remove clot. Um, clearly, patients with critical ischemia and a non-healing wound, uh, the multidisciplinary team approach is optimal. Uh, studies have shown decreased amputation rates uh, from 36 to 86 percent when patients are treated uh, with a multidisciplinary team. So that's why Dr. Richwine and I are constantly on the phone with each other or texting. Uh, so the care uh, should pr um, coordinate the diagnosis, offloading, preventative care, and revascularization, so everyone has to be uh, talking. And the team can be variable from patient to patient and their needs, but many times it's a primary care physician, a vascular specialist, podiatrist, wound care, infectious disease, endocrinologists, and surgeons for debridements and amputations, when unfortunately they sometimes are required. Uh, so team approach clearly maximizes patient outcomes, so really many ways our best asset is each other and what we can bring to the table uh, to work together. And clearly there's a paradigm shift which has happened. Um, studies have shown 85% of the amputations are preceded by a foot ulcer. 80% um, of hospital admissions for diabetics are for infected foot ulcers and amputation doubles one year mortality which we talked about. So the paradigm shift is to really prevent this before it happens. And this is a slide that uh, I took from someone else who took from someone else who took from someone else who took from Dr. Walker, I think, his quote. Uh, so for some reason, it is considered conservative treatment to chop someone's leg off and aggressive treatment to even do an angiogram, which is true. The patient that I showed you with the ABI of one that had previous toe amputation and now a black toe never had any vascular workup. Uh, the, another paradigm shift which has happened over the last decade to two uh, is endovascular first before surgery. Uh, there was a trial uh, published in 2005, finalized in 2010, called the BASIL trial, which looked at prospectively, uh, prospective randomized uh, controlled trial, which looked at angioplasty versus bypass first. Uh, 
Uh, there was no real difference in the five-year amputation, free survival. Um, and one must also consider the uh, you know, nearly double mortality rate seen uh, with bypass uh, patients compared to endovascular treatments, as I saw in my patient. Um, and this is a similar approach which has been applied to um, cardiology and treating coronary artery disease. And again, this, is, uh, this study was from technology from 10 years ago. We have newer technology um, all the time. This is another interesting study, um, and this was uh, a single center, sorry, single center 12 year um, review. They looked at 1,615 patients over time. So, all the way to the left in 1999, uh, you can see that they didn't even have um, endovascular options at that point, and their amputation rate was 32% for critical limb ischemia. If you fast forward to 2010, 11 years later, their amputation rate dropped to 5.2%, and now they're treating 89% of their patients with endovascular treatments. So it has made a significant difference in this single center patient population. This is not to say that there's no role for surgery. There certainly is. Uh, there are some hybrid procedures which sometimes we will do. Uh, for instance, combining a common femoral endarterectomy with endovascular treatment of the SFA or iliac or something of that nature uh, to limit the uh, surgical aspect of the procedure. Uh, clearly, if there's uh, been a failure of an endovascular treatment, surgical um, treatment is, uh, should be a consideration. Um, I will say that uh, vein bypass, autologous vein bypass vein bypass grafts are significantly better. There have been studies that have looked at uh, the PTFE graft for an SFA, comparing that to the covered stent graft, and the data is pretty much identical. Uh, there's a limited uh, candidacy in this patient population. As I mentioned, they are quite fragile with many comorbidities. <clears throat> um, and one thing, uh, as someone who treats patients endovascularly, one thing we always have to consider is what is our plan D? When my A, B, and C endovascular options don't work, I need to keep in the back of my mind uh, that the surgeon may see this patient for a bypass, so I need to keep those options open for him or her. I put here endovascular complication with a question mark, because I shouldn't say it's but knock on wood, I've never had to call a surgeon for a complication that I've had. Not that I haven't had complications, but I fixed my own complications, or my partners helped me fix my complications. Um, and that's the goal, um, to avoid surgery. Uh, this basically just um, reinforces what I said about per preserving options. Um, so if I can avoid placing a stent across the popliteal artery where a surgeon may do a fempop bypass graft, I certainly want to, but that's not always possible, but certainly something that we're always thinking about. <clears throat> For critical limb ischemia, uh, below knee interventions are very common. Uh, the surgical option below knee is not all that great. Uh, nearly all advanced diabetics and diabetic foot ulcers have below knee disease. So this is a large part of our practice. Uh, part of a successful limb salvage team must include the ability to treat these complex below knee cases. Um, calcium is one thing that we're constantly dealing with. Uh, it's disproportionately deposited below the uh, inguinal ligament, particularly below the knee. Uh, particularly in patients with diabetes and renal patients. And here you can see your radiograph and the arrows designate a very calcified dorsalis pedis artery. So to maximize the outcomes below knee, um, obviously uh, anyone dealing with the, in this territory has to have advanced wire and microcatheter techniques and supplies. Um, up to uh, 10 to 20 percent of anti-grade approaches fail with significant uh, occlusions, particularly below knee, meaning that um, when we're trying to go down the artery, either from the contralateral groin up and over to that side or direct puncture down towards the calf, um, 10 to 20 percent of those uh, attempts at crossing the occlusion will fail. Um, most times, if we can try a retrograde approach, meaning that we are actually accessing an artery in the foot and going backwards, um, the morphology of the plaque is such that uh, most times that way we will be able to cross it. And there's some adjunctive devices on the market uh, which help improve pat uh, patency and minimize complications, the biggest of which is atherectomy. Uh, this slide just shows how we uh, access commonly dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial. Um, I access my first plantar arch branch on a patient's heel two weeks ago. That was fun. So these are, can be very challenging. Um, and technically demanding uh, accesses. Um, 
angiosome concept is something over the past 10 to 20 years which has um, become more popular and basically uh, what this means our goal if depending on where a wound is we consider it uh, similar to a dermatome uh, we consider what uh, artery supplies that area where the wound is and we try and open specifically that vessel to aid in healing of the wound which I'll show you a great case of that uh, towards the end. Uh, orbital atherectomy this is uh, the uh, small varying size uh, device that we have which we can treat either SFA down to the tibial vessels um, basically has a little uh, diamond um, sanding device on the end of the catheter which spins at between 60 and 120,000 RPMs uh, and basically differentially sands away the calcium from the the plaque and the vessel that's there the it doesn't really debulk the plaque it's not really taking plaque out but it changes the morphology of the plaque so that it makes a hard plaque which if I were to put a balloon in an angioplasty it cracks and then tears the vessel wall resulting in a dissection and then an occlusion of the vessel uh, this changes the compliance of the vessel wall so that when I do the angioplasty it's more of a controlled um, dilatation of the vessel and it re significantly reduces the rate of dissection uh, this was just some of the data from that. It reduced the stent use in the superficial femoral artery as well as um, uh, helped in the uh, below knee vessels, significantly lowering restenosis rates and adverse outcomes. Uh, clearly, these uh, patients, uh, Dr. Richwine mentioned that the uh, healthcare costs are quite significant, and these are not cheap procedures, but in the end, if it accelerates the wound healing and prevents uh, amputation, it's clearly worth it. So this is what I like to think. This is actually my coffee cup. <laughs> uh, this is what I like to think that we're magical somehow. Interventional radiology is magical and that we have little unicorns dancing around us as we work. But this is really more of the reality of it. Um, the reality is there really is no magic bullet other than hard work. And these are very demanding cases and I can spend two, three, four hours on a tibial case. Um, so they're very, very demanding cases and, and patients to treat. So this, uh, just to go through some uh, cases quickly, uh, I mentioned managing complications, so I put this as my first case. Uh, and it's funny how when there's a complication, it's always from an outside institution, isn't it? It's never the same place. <laughs> so this was a 77-year-old female who came to our emergency room, an acutely ischemic left leg. She had a history of previous left fempop uh, vein bypass graft several years ago. More recently, uh, underwent angiography at an outside facility. I have no idea what they did. Um, the patient had an ultrasound, which I spelled wrong, and CTA, uh, which showed a pseudoaneurysm in the expected location of the SFA. On exam, she had an acutely ischemic leg. She had pain, pallor, the whole nine yards, uh, no pulses. Um, and this was the CTA. And you can see the image on the left is a coronal uh, image like this, and then an axial image. And you can see there's a stent, which is there, and then there's this bubble of contrast around it, and then a little bubble further out of clot around that. So I'm not sure what this was, in all honesty. I'm not sure where this was, whether this was in a vein bypass graft, whether this was the native SFA, I'm not really sure. Um, and this was a complication, actually, I believe that the other, whoever treated this patient previously, and I think what happened, what I surmise is that they used an atherectomy device, and particularly um, one of the atherectomy devices, a directional atherectomy device, that's one of the risks of the of that type of atherectomy device where you end up with a pseudoaneurysm because it's basically cutting away part of the wall. And I think that's probably what happened. They probably did an angiogram, they did an atherectomy, they did an angioplasty, it didn't work, so they placed the stent, and this is what they were left with. And this was hopefully it plays. Uh, this was the picture that I got from my angiogram. So that uh, is the, my sheet is in the common femoral artery antegrade down towards the foot so the profunda femoral artery that little vessel to the right is open and then the sfa is closed with this stent um, and then this was further distal uh, those little branches that you're seeing are superficial femoral artery and right at the bottom of the screen at the level of the knee you can see the popliteal artery come in uh, so clearly this is why she had an acutely ischemic leg in addition to having a giant pseudoaneurysm so we were successful in getting down through the stent. One of the difficulties is getting through the stent, not getting through one of the side holes of the stent because that was an uncovered stent. Uh, 
Um, so we were successful in getting all the way through the occluded segment of the vessel. So this is my catheter all the way down in the popliteal artery. And in this particular case, given the pseudoaneurysm, we opted to use this stent graft. Um, and this is after the stent graft. So you can no longer see filling of that uh, vessel. And the SFA or graft, whatever that was, is patent all the way down to the level of the popliteal artery. And this just kind of shows you the flow. So there's great flow through it. So this was clearly a win, and the, uh, the patient did uh, great after this. Uh, second case, six-year-old male, long-standing history of diabetes, renal insufficiency, uh, presented for consultation, new ulceration over the third and fourth toes of his uh, left foot, I think it was. Uh, denies pain, but he did have a neuropathy. Also reported non-healing wounds over the left foot with previous amputation of the left fourth metatarsal. Oh, I'm sorry, this was the patient that had no previous angiogram. So he had previous um, amputations and no previous angiogram. On physical exam, there was an ulceration on the third and fourth toes, fairly superficial. Uh, erythematous changes over the dorsum of the foot. His ABI was also normal, 1.26 and 1.18. And I'm sorry, it was right foot with the wound. Um, so his pulses were pretty good, except for he had no dorsalis pedis pulse on the right. And this, this was his foot, and you can see the uh, ulceration over his third and fourth toes. Here's his angiogram, that's uh, starting all the way up in the aorta. Uh, so you can see the, ilia the aorta, iliac arteries, everything looks good. No inflow disease, um, and his superficial femoral artery and popliteal artery, everything looked good. And of note, this was the carbon dioxide angiogram, so these are all pretty nice pictures for zero contrast so far. And I, I opted for the carbon dioxide because he had some renal, renal insufficiency. Uh, so this is over his calf, and you can see on uh, the image on the right, you can see that there's a posterior tibial artery all the way on that side. The center vessel would be the perineal, and you're not really seeing the anterior tibial artery. So here, a better picture of that. You can see in the arrow on the image on the left, the anterior tibial artery just kind of, you just don't see it that well. It just stops in the proximal calf. And then distally, the other picture is all the way down by the ankle, so it is open down below. And this is with a catheter directly in the anterior tubular artery. So he had normal vessels except for the anterior tubular artery, so one abnormal vessel. But that was in the angiosome of where his wound was. So we decided to fix it. Um, here's our orbital atherectomy catheter, followed by our balloon. And then here's our post-treatment images. You can see that artery is now open. On the picture on the left, there's three vessels where there was really only two before. So we, as I mentioned, we do follow all of these patients up. He was seen at a month. He was doing great with no complaints. Uh, access site was fine. He had a plus two dorsalis pedis pulse where he had none before. And that was his wound in one month. So he did great. Case three, long-standing history of diabetes, multiple comorbidities. Um, previous wounds, amputation of right, fourth, and fifth toes, disabling rest pain. So he was a rest pain case, not an actual wound at, at current time. No palpable or dopplable pulses in the right foot. He initially underwent an angiogram on, uh, in June 16th, and this is what we saw. Uh, basically, no named contiguous vessel from the popliteal artery down to his calf. He's got all these squiggly little collateral vessels there. You can see all the way down at the ankle on top of his foot, you can see his dorsalis pedis come back through the collateral flow. Despite working my behind off and spending three plus hours on him, I was not successful in getting through this occlusion. Uh, I did have antegrade access and retrograde access, so wires um, going both directions, and I was subintimal from both sides, but just never able to connect the access sites. Um, he continued to have severe rest pain after the procedure. So we decided to uh, try again because we don't give up, we're stubborn. And I say extreme because these, these cases are pretty extreme. So this again was uh, a little over a month later. Uh, we did antegrade access again from the common femoral, so similar approach. Um, sim uh, similar approach again, we accessed the dorsalis pedis. And injecting from below, you can see this, his uh, anterior tibial artery looked like Swiss cheese. It's basically a bunch of holes in the intima, intimal, subintimal channels, but we were never able to connect it to the top and the bottom, which is okay. You know, there's something called subintimal recanalization, which is you know something that people do if you can't get through the center lumen of the vessel. 
Uh, so same problem, we had two subintimal channels that just would not connect. Uh, so we used a different technique, something called the two, two balloon uh, technique. So we had an angioplasty balloon from the top and from the bottom and basically did an angioplasty which allows us to connect these two channels. Um, once we connected the two, the two channels, I was able to get a wire through and we did something called a safari, which is uh, subintimal arterial flossing with the integrated retrograde intervention. That's why we call it safari. Um, and basically it means that the wire enters one access site, goes through the entire body, comes out the other access site, so I can literally stand there with both hands of the wire, uh, with, I'm sorry, with either hand, end of the wire in either hand. It allows greater pushability and it, it gets you to a good spot where you can pretty much fix anything if you can get yourself in that situation. Um, so we did a lot of balloon angioplasty throughout the tibial and we ended up with one patent vessel at the end. And he did great, I saw him at, uh, at least at a month, he had uh, plus two Drusel's pedis artery. Uh, another case, long history of smoking, hypertension, he was a brother for three, so he was claudication. Um, physical exam, no palpable DP or PT pulses, uh, though they were present, but monophasic on Doppler. He had a CTA, which uh, showed a long segment probably about 20 centimeter SFA occlusion. Uh, so we did an angiogram and here's the pictures from the angiogram. You can see the profundo uh, femoral artery collaterals there and a segmental occlusion of the SFA and reconstitution towards the distal calf right above the knee. Uh, there's my crossing catheter going through the area which is occluded um, and I got all the way down to where the lumen came back but the wire didn't look right. It's kind of off to the side. So we actually went backwards. As I said, many times you can cross it going backwards. So we went backwards and were able to cross uh, through, snared the wire. So again, I had both ends of the wire, although it wasn't subintimal this time, um, but we did have both ends of the wire and actually changed the access site so that I could use uh, this protection device. So this was the uh, filter wire that I mentioned earlier. So we positioned down this down in the pop -tier artery and then we used um, this device, it's one of the other types of atherectomy device, which actually does debulking, takes out plaque, both calcified and non-calcified. And this was quite impressive. This is um, probably one of the earlier times when I've used this device. You can seal the gunk plaque crap that's stuck in the, the filter. <laughs> Thank God I used the filter. Um, so this is post, uh, the image here to the left is post atherectomy, and then we did a balloon, and this is what we left them with. Um, so no stent, so we preserved all options. When they come out with a drug-eluting stent next year and he has a restenosis, I'll probably end up using that. Um, and he did great, uh, ended up with no pain and plus two DP and PT pulses. Last one, sorry. 87-year-old, um, multiple uh, comorbidities, diabetes, uh, severe lifestyle limit and claudication. He was a Rutherford IV. Uh, CTA showed an SFA stenosis and pop to artery occlusion. We did an angiogram. So we had some stenosis there in his proximal SFA and his pop -tier artery was occluded. And again, this is um, a, a time, it's across the knee. There's no great surgical options here. There's no push, there's no pop -tier artery to bypass graft two. Um, and then there's his runoff, which is diseased as well. So what we did for him, we were able to cross the occlusion. We did the atherectomy because we did cross intraluminally and we also treated his posterior tibial artery and treated that SFA lesion. So here's what we left him with from, uh, you know, pretty much disabling uh, rest pain to no pain. And again, he was seen at one month and he did great. He still had a plus two PT pulse when I saw him at a month. And that was like a couple weeks ago. Okay, questions? If somebody has multiple risk factors and diabetic screen before age 50, at what frequency or interval would you rescreen them I believe the recommendations are usually six months to a year. I think they're actually a year, but sometimes I'll go six months. Um, and again, it depends on the patient. You're going to follow the patient, make sure they don't have any change in symptoms or, um, you know, de obviously a development of a wound. Okay. And, and you're 65 and older with no risk factors, but you said that should be screened? Yes. Uh, would that be every year, every five years? I th believe it's every, every year. I think it's annual. For the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the, 
Right. So from, from medical management with regards to claudication, really uh, silest silestazole, I rarely prescribe these medications, um, but usually it's silestazole is the medication for a claudication that helps with the pain. So really, really if a patient has um, uh, claudication and you're going to try a conservative therapy, it's really a regimented exercise, um, which basically just means you tell them to walk until it hurts, walk five minutes more, then take a break, and then walk again. And you're basically trying to lengthen the time that they can exercise, um, that they can walk without feeling pain to, you know, to get improvement. And basically what you're doing with the exercise is um, you're developing the collaterals. Obviously, you're not going to treat any area that's narrow, but you're going to develop the collaterals so that you know, they're supplied by the collaterals. Uh, Silestazole is really uh, more for like the pain, and it works on like a vasodilatory basis. Um, and then obviously any other medications to you know the statins for lipids and aspirin is a good thing. At least aspirin, um, as I said, that one trial, the jeez, uh, I cannot say that word. Capri trial um, showed that patients with symptomatic PADs, meaning patients with claudication due to uh, peripheral arterial disease, did better with clopidogrel uh, compared to aspirin. But certainly you at least want to have them on aspirin. Um, and I, the studies that I've uh, seen have shown that, that aspirin, the 81 milligrams, is probably just as good as the 325. So. Any, any role for ACE um, not specifically other than for hypertension. Um, I did have a patient, actually I called the primary the other day. She had, she, she was an interesting case. Um, she had rest pain when I treated her and still had some pain. And when I walked into her into the office, it was just last week, uh, to see her, her toes were white, which kind of scared me. And then as I'm sitting there, they changed bluish, pinkish. And I'm like, oh, so there's some type of Raynaud's underlying Raynaud's phenomenon going on there. And she was hypertensive. She was on an ACE. And I called the uh, primary and I said, maybe why don't we try her on a calcium channel blocker because calcium channel blockers can help with, uh, with the uh, Raynaud's phenomenon. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. I know it's hard before lunch. <laughs>